I asked these three distinguished gentlemen up the front here whether I could introduce them as the three monkeys, and they said as long as I call them the three wise monkeys that that is fine. <laughs> so the three wise monkeys up here, um, three absolutely wonderful science communicators. They have helped me out heaps over the years with my junior field naturalists and CSIRO's Double Helix Science Club. They are fantastic at promoting science to people of all ages and in particular children, which is my special interest. So, we're going to start. Philip, you're the first one off. I'm right, first. okay, we're starting with Philip Roatman. Now, Philip conducts research within the Barbara Hardy Institute of the um, University of South Australia. He's particularly interested in people's attitudes towards the natural environment. Philip's an integral part of the multidisciplinary team behind the Barbara Hardy Institute's Citizen Science Research and Education Program. Now, um, Philip's obviously been involved with the citizen science for a bit. And I don't know if any of you remember, he got a lovely little mug shot in the advertiser at one stage when they were doing Operation Possum. So it's an absolutely beautiful picture with a little possum in the foreground and Philip in the background. And evidently the photographer tried a number of ways to get sort of the possum and Philip into the picture. And one of the ways was to what, put the possum down his T-shirt. And after being urinated on by the cute little possum, <laughs> they ended up with quite a different picture. So the possum did look cute. Philip was a blurred in the background, so you didn't know. So, um, Philip, over to you. Ah, great. Thanks very much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, tonight, I'm going to introduce Citizen Science and talk about the projects we've run over the last four years. And then I'm going to hand over to my left, Professor Chris Daniels, who's going to talk about community engagement through Citizen Science. And then we have a, 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 a quasi-member of our team, or a quasi-outsider, depending on which way you look at it. Uh, just James, quasi, really. Just quasi. quasi yeah. <laughs> we have quasi-James Smith, who's going to talk about citizen science and his experience as someone who's involved in uh, wildlife and people's back gardens. So it should be a great night. And we're looking forward to questions at the end. So what is citizen science? There's a great uh, definition on the screen, and that is that professional researchers engage the public to collect or analyse data within a cooperative framework of research and education. Now there are three key words in that statement. The first one is engage. We're engaging the public. The second one is education. There's an educational component to citizen science projects. And the third one is research. That we're doing research while we're running these projects. And they're all key to citizen science. And I think we'll elucidate that as we go through our presentation. The second point is that it's a rapidly developing research methodology. There are many more projects coming online every week in Citizen Science, and there's a couple of pro uh, websites that you can log on to. Uh, CitizenScience.org is one of them. And you can see the new, uh, web, uh, new programs coming online every day, every week, around the world. So it's really exciting to be a part of uh, this developing methodology. Uh, but also there's a lot of scientific papers now coming out of these projects. So it has a scientific basis and we are doing research as well as engaging and educating at the same time. And there's this great potential, my third point is there's a great potential to engage new people and do new kinds of research. Um, it's really been only sort of the tip of the iceberg so far for citizen science. And there's a whole lot more we can do. So it's really exciting to be a part of this uh, research thrust, if you like. I thought it'd be interesting to give you a bit of a, a tour of citizen science over the ages, if you like. Uh, of course, citizen science has been around for a long time, uh, but not necessarily under the name citizen science. The first uh, documented example of a project that I can find is this chap, Wells Cook, at the top of the list. And he was a, a chap in the US who was interested in collecting some data about the, the migrating birds that flew over his, where he lived. And, uh, and he thought, well, I can see a few in, uh, during the day. I see a few every night. I see a few, and I record those. But wouldn't it be great? if I could get more information about these. I can't be out there all the time. So he enlisted his friends to help him collect information about the birds that migrated past the area where they lived. And that went on for until the 1950s. So they collected a, a whole lot of data, and that data is still being analysed today, so that's really exciting. The second project, and it's the one that's often cited as the first citizen science project, although clearly it's not, is the Audubon Society's Christmas Bird Count. And this is an amazing project, been going for over 100 years. Uh, in the first year, in 1900, it had 27 people involved at Christmas time observing birds in North America. But as you can see on the slide, uh, to date, it's still going 110 years, 111 years later, and has around 60,000 people every year at Christmas collecting information about birds. And there's a lot of things you can do with that quantity of data if you're doing a, a, a single day survey of birds and what birds are in what locations. eBird is the third one on my list, and I've included that because it's run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. 
And they're the big players in citizen science, if you like. They've got a lot of projects uh, run uh, throughout America, mainly focused on birds. Uh, and we are starting to collaborate them with them, we hope, in the next uh, couple of years to run some international projects. It'll be really exciting. That's because he wants a US holiday. <laughs> <laughs> There's also some great research areas in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> And the next one on my list <laughs> is Project Bud Burst. Oh, we've got to talk. <laughs> and I thought I'd mention this one because it's not a bird project. The first three have all been bird projects. And, and they're, birds are great for citizen science projects because they're something that everyone sees and they're easy to access. But it's not just birds. And there's even been maths projects and invertebrate projects and all sorts of projects uh, that have involved uh, community in the research. Uh, but the Project Bud Burst is uh, looking at the timing of flowering plants across North America. Uh, the exciting thing about that is that you can collect information on uh, the changing uh, timing of the, of the flowering plants. And, and it's very difficult for scientists to do this kind of thing because there's a large area to cover and you don't know when you need to be there to find out when the plants are, are, are flowering. So having people let you know, let the scientists know, works really well. And this is what citizen science is about, uh, a partnership with the community. So they give you information as a scientist. The next one on the list is Water Watch. And I thought I'd include that for two reasons. One, it's different. It's about water. It's about monitoring waterways. And two, it's an Australian project. And there's about 15,000 individuals each year that get, out, get involved. And then we've got some NRM people who are involved in the project too, which is great. Why can't I put that on the slide? And the last one on the list is the Globe at Night. And this is looking at light pollution. And again, another, another way to do citizen science. Another subject area you can touch on. There's all sorts of things you can do with citizen science. And this has participants around the world, 86 countries involved in the project. So you can do these really large scale projects over long periods of time and over large areas, uh, which is really important when you're monitoring how climates are changing or how the world is changing. Things happen on big scales and it's great to be able to monitor them with small teams of scientists. So we've been involved uh, over the last few years in what I call a, a series of operations. The first one in 2007 was Operation Blue Tongue where we looked at the distributions of blue tongue lizards around South Australia. And we had people from around South Australia collect information for us about those. It was an online survey and it was promoted through ABC Radio. So people heard about Operation Blue Tongue and if they'd seen a blue tongue lizard, they were asked to go into their computer, log on and give us a little bit of information about the blue tongue they'd seen and how they interact with blue tongues more generally. The next year we ran Operation Possum and after Operation Blue Tongue, we got excited about a couple of things. One was that people got involved and we had a great response, and I'll show you some, some numbers in a minute. Uh, but two was we thought, wow, what can we do with this? People responded, we can do more with this. And we not only looked at possums for that one, we looked at uh, environmental attitudes as well. So we asked people to tell us a little bit about themselves while they were telling us about the possums they were seeing. Then in 2009, we ran Operation Magpie. And we also uh, were asking questions there about people's magpie observations. We asked them to actually go outside and fill in a form, uh, observe magpies, look at the activities they were conducting in their back gardens or in their parks, and then come inside and load that information online uh, onto our online survey. And then also tell us again a little bit about themselves and a little bit about their, their place attachment to their back gardens. Because these are, as James will talk about later, back gardens are a, are a really important place where people interact with wildlife. And then last year we ran Operation Spider. In Operation Spider we were looking at uh, people's um, feelings towards spiders. Are they scared of them? That sort of thing. Their attitudes. And also the distributions of spiders around South Australia. So the key points about these were that they were, they were online surveys. We asked people to hop online and, and tell us information about the animals they were seeing. Uh, but we had some important partners also. Uh, the Department for Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, ABC Radio were, were, were part of the team and they were promoting uh, our surveys on the radio uh, and the South Australian Museum. So we had these strategic partnerships. So how did we choose these focus animals? What, what, were, what was interesting about these animals? Um, I suppose most importantly uh, was probably starting from the bottom that these animals are, are charismatic. It's a citizen science project. We wanted people to, to get involved in these projects. So we really needed to pique people's interest in what we were studying. So I suppose we wanted to choose things that were charismatic, but we, we needed to also choose something that we wanted to learn something about. Also, because these animals are, uh, occur in urban areas, uh, but then they cause, some of them cause problems in urban areas, for instance, possums, 
magpies, spiders. It's really interesting to study people's environmental attitudes through these animals. Because they're not animals that people love to see around all the time. They're, they're animals that people love to see, but they also have some problems with. And uh, the animals have been described by Blair as being either urban avoiders, urban adapters, or urban exploiters. And certainly with possums uh, and magpies, we're studying animals which are urban adapters. They do well in urban environments. So there's that interplay between people and the animals all the time. There's a lot of these animals in urban areas, and there's not necessarily so many in, in, in rural areas, especially for possums. They're rare in South Australia now. They're declining in numbers, but in urban areas, they're doing well. So there's this important interaction with people, and if we want to conserve possums in South Australia, urban areas become really important. So what are the benefits of citizen science? Why do we do citizen science? First of all, we can collect data, and that's the, the research side of things. We can collect data over a, over a large area, and the map on the right is from Operation Possum, and it's not where the possums were sighted, it's where people returned surveys from. And the larger dots are 50 survey returns. So we had uh, quite a number of surveys across the state, a couple of thousand, and some suburbs had up to 50 survey returns. So we get a lot of information over a large area. Some of the projects can also be run long term, like the Audubon Society's Christmas Bird Count, so you can look at how things change over time. Also importantly, uh, some of the projects and some of the, or these animals that we've been studying live in places that for scientists are difficult to access. People's back gardens, inside people's houses. So by asking people to give us the information rather than having to go into those places, because scientists in white coats wandering into people's back gardens saying, oh, I'm just looking at the possums, don't worry about me, doesn't work very well. So having those people we've give We've tried us it, it doesn't work. <laughs> Having those people send the information in to us is really the only way we can get that data. The last point is the types of data that we can collect. And what we realised uh, during Operation Blue Tongue, at the end of Operation Blue Tongue, our first one, was that we could collect different types of information. And we can collect information not only about the animal that we're studying, but also about the people and how they interact with that animal. Because how the people interact with the animal is so important for conservation. So here's some of our survey results, how, how many people we've had involved and, and how the, surveys, the survey instruments have worked online. Top left hand corner, Operation Blue Tongue was the first one that we ran and we had 1500 survey responses. We thought, great, that's amazing. We asked people to respond only if they'd actually seen a blue tongue lizard. And you can see uh, from the start of the survey, it ran over three months, it kind of built up momentum and, and tracked along quite nicely. I've put the same time scale on the, on the left hand side of each graph so that you can compare them all. Uh, so this one doesn't go very high, but it, over the three months period, we still got 1,500 responses. What's really interesting is then we ran Operation Possum the following year, bottom left-hand corner. And we asked people to respond even if they hadn't seen a possum. So I thought, wow, this is going to be amazing. We're going to have thousands of responses because everyone's going to respond. It's not what we found, though. We, we got more responses, yes. But we also found that people really felt that they needed to have an experience with the animal during the survey period to get involved in the project. And that's a, that's a finding in itself, that people, to do a citizen science project, you can't do things that, that are intangible, that people aren't going to, to be involved in during the survey period, survey period. Even if they've been involved in it in the past, you really want something that's going to hit them. The second interesting thing was the difference in the trend line, if you like. The way that on the first day we got almost 250 responses. People were waiting for Operation Possum to come along, and they did it on the first day. And then it tracked along for three months, sort of slowly, up and down. When we went on the radio and promoted it through the ABC, it went up a little bit, but then it just tracked along. And at the end, it, it peaked up a little bit again. And Chris loves to, to describe that like the students handing in assignments. They always <laughs> hand them in at the end. Or uh, you can't see on the, on the graphs, actually, just after the last day. It also goes up a little bit further. Yeah, people want an extension on their assignments. Uh, <laughs> The next interesting thing that we did was Operation Magpie, and we realised after, well, after that result for Operation Possum, after that sort of slow tracking along for three months, we thought, well, do we need to run the project for three months? How about we condense it? If we're going to have that sort of response, let's condense it to six weeks and see what kind of results we get. And you can see that the total numbers did reduce it a little. We got about 1,800 responses for Operation Magpie in a six-week period. But the trend was very similar, although every day we got a few more returns. So we had that big start, and then it tracked along, up and down a bit for the, for the six weeks. And then, again, an extension on the assignment, please, on the last day or, or just after. And then we did something completely different. After Operation Magpie, we did Operation Spider. 
again over a six week period. But spiders turned out quite differently. And we had a lot of evidence that people didn't want to get involved in Operation Spider because it was spiders. And we had a lot fewer adults getting involved in the project. But by this time, we had an education program that was really tracking along nicely. And you can see the first half of Operation Spider has got some big, chunky return days in it. And that's because there are a lot of classes getting involved. 30 kids at a time <laughs> within 10 minutes. 30 kids at a time within 10 minutes would be, would be all putting in their, um, in their responses to Operation Spider. So the, you can see that this is a, a program that's developed over the four years. It's, each project has been distinct, but we've really learnt a lot uh, by running this program over four years and how, that, how, the, how the surveys have changed and how the response to those has changed. The education program has been really important. And as I said at the start, education is a really important component of citizen science. And most projects around the world have an informal, call it an informal education component. You need to give so people some information about a, a species or a phenomenon that you're studying so they can do what you want them to do. You often need to give them a little bit of education first up so that they can go out and monitor what it is you want. So for instance, when we did Operation Possum, we needed to make sure that people could tell the difference between a brush tail and a ring tail possum. So we had to have some, some educational fact sheets. We talked about it on the radio. We had some um, actually embedded in the survey. There were photos of them with a little description saying the easy way to, to tell the difference between a brush tail and a ring tail possum. So there's, there's some informal education there. But we've also had this formal education program getting it into schools. And that started slowly but really built up through this program that we've run. And, and schools have been really important because uh, it's getting kids involved. And kids, as Rona said, are very important, and especially for environmental attitudes. It's where they develop those environmental attitudes um, for the, that they maintain for their lives. And to get good environmental attitudes, first of all, we've got, we've got things that are tangible that they're studying. So they're, they're studying possums and blue tongues and magpies, things that kids see, they understand. That's really important. Um, and also, we're getting them outdoors and actually observing them. So classes go outside and look for spiders. Classes go outside and sit down and, and observe magpies and record what they're doing. And we've had great feedback from teachers that this really works. Uh, the kids are excited. Kids that are normally uh, difficult to manage, you wouldn't let them outside um, unsupervised. Uh, they've been letting classes go out onto the oval and to all parts of schools, having a look at these animals. And they're very well behaved. The kids are being quiet to watch the animals. It's fantastic. And it's all about our bilateral exchange of information. So we're giving that little bit of information first so that people can and do do the surveys. Secondly, people are giving information back to us. And as, as Chris will talk about later, then we have to give that information back again. Citizen science is about this constant exchange through the three programs that we've run, four projects we've run. And there's a quick slide that I'll just show you briefly about our education program. And as you can see, uh, the, the four projects are listed along the bottom, Operation Blue Tongue first on the left. And in, in, in the hollow area is the number of teachers we distributed materials to or who accessed materials. And then in the red is the number of teachers who ran a full unit of work, so really got involved, ran numerous lessons over a sort of an extended time period with their class, and some of them did this online survey as well, some didn't. Uh, and then in the green is the number of teachers who, who just got involved a little bit, saw the materials and ran maybe a lesson or two or used them in some other way in their classroom. And, we, and you can see the growth that's evident on, in the graph, it's great. Um, the first year we just sent out CD-ROMs to a few teachers we knew, and you can see we sent out 30 to 30 classes and six of them got involved. The next year, we did the same thing. Put some resources on a CD-ROM and sent them out to a few more this year. We heard a few more people were interested, so we sent them out to 50-odd teachers and uh, 18 got involved in the project and ran units of work. The next year, two important things happened. The first one was we went online. Rather than sending out CD-ROMs, we put all the resources online so that any teacher could access them. The second thing we did was we got the School of Education involved. And they help us put together some fantastic resources that were linked to curriculum, stuff that we didn't know about linking to curriculum and, and an in integrative uh, teaching sequence. And so something that teachers knew how to use, something that gave the teachers all the information they needed to do a project, and something that also encouraged the teachers to find more and, and feed back to us. So it was, it was interactive with the teachers, but in the classroom it was also interactive between the, the, the teachers and the students. And you can see the immediate response in, uh, for Operation Magpie, we had almost 300 teachers access the online materials. We had over 30 teachers, or so 30 teachers, actually running units of work, and 32 teachers who uh, used the materials in some way. And the next year, 
Over 300 teachers accessed the materials and over 100 teachers used them. Fantastic. Now, 100 teachers means over 3,000 kids around the state were involved in Operation Spider. 3,000 kids learning about spiders, many of them doing the online survey as well, which is why we had those chunky returns in the first half. So we had a f we've had a really uh, great success with this education program, which has been great. Great f not only for collecting data, but for engaging and for educating. This, this, the last slide I showed you showed the growth of the education program, and I think this one does too. It shows the age cohorts of so survey respondents. Again, we start with Blue Tongue on the left and work through to Operation Spider on the right. And the big difference you can see is the, the growth of the bottom dark group, which is the 0 to 10 uh, year old children who are involved in the projects. Operation uh, Blue Tongue started off with uh, about 5% of our survey respondents being under 10 years old. But when we got to Operation Spider, we're getting up to 35-40% uh, of, the, of the people being involved. And that's for two reasons. One is the growth of the education program, and two is the demise of adults being involved because it's spiders. <laughs> yeah, don't want to do that. Another important thing to note here is that we're also growing the area uh, that between 10 and 40. Now, we had a, a great partnership, we've had a great partnership with these projects with the ABC, with 891 Radio and they've promoted these really well. And that's a great way to attract people who are over 35. We've had a great response from those people, and you can see that with Operation Blue Tongue, Operation Possum, and Operation Magpie. And then we've learned to ramp up this education program, so we've had a fantastic response from people under 10. But there's a gap in between 10 and 35. And we were wondering how we'd engage those people as well. And so we started with Operation Possum, sorry, with Operation Spider, to attract Generation Z, digital natives. And we did that by going Facebook and YouTube. So we had an Operation Spider Facebook page where we put photos and information about spiders and had links back to our survey. Everything links back to the survey. And we also could interact with people through a Facebook page. It's a great thing about social media. People can ask questions and you can answer them straight online there. And we had a YouTube video. And the YouTube video uh, had 1,000 views during our survey period. And, and in terms of educational videos on YouTube, it was ranked up there with top American universities on YouTube EDU. So we had a really great response to our, and it's still online, check it out when you, when you go home. Check out the Operation Spider YouTube video. It's great for our stats if you do, thanks. Um, and you can see uh, that we've achieved what we were trying to do, and that is we're trying to hit that gap between 10 and 35. How do we get those people involved? The graph down the bottom shows that about 65% of the people logging onto our Facebook page were under uh, 25 years of age. So that's, that's who we're trying to hit. So we now have, have looked at different ways of engaging different segments of the community into our citizen science projects. And we need to. We need to engage people. We need to educate people. I'm going to hand over to Chris to talk about this uh, lovely cat. <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil. Yeah, um, I'm going to talk about two things. Um, firstly, is the big question about why educate, and then we're going to have a look at a look at some of the data and what we think of the strengths and weaknesses that we've discovered with citizen science over these past four years. Why educate? Well, to start with, there's a lot of people out there who really don't have a clue about about wildlife, and this and you've probably all seen this circulate over time. So it did went all viral on the email about cat found, male, no collar, light tan with grey and black not very friendly, think it might be scared, not housebroken, sad face, uh, found uh, January the 23rd, please come and get it. Uh, hopefully you all know that that is of course a possum. So someone can't tell the difference between a possum and a cat. So one of the easy things to do about why educate. I think that person may have the same problem that I have. Why does that do that? That's my back going, is it? Whoops. Oh, the arrow, okay. Okay, so the, the first thing we've got to do is get the community engaged and provide them with some information. And in fact, it's more than just that people don't know what's going on um, and don't know much about wildlife. But secondly, we, we needed to do it for the survey itself. So what we wanted to do was provide information, education materials, so that people actually knew enough to do the survey. And we'll talk about some problems about where they, couldn't, they didn't have enough information and made mistakes. More importantly, we wanted to get some enthusiasm going. And Phil's mentioned the point that if we use a charismatic animal, 
That is a nice break. It starts people like magpies, like possums. But often they need even more information so they can understand how to do a survey. How does science work? Um, how do you fill in these things? What, what are we actually after? And then by getting people to provide information, it was really important for us to deliver it back. And that is that, that feedback loop that's a really important part of citizen science. Many projects collect information and we as scientists say, thanks very much, great unwashed, off we'll go, we'll write our papers, our careers will go ahead and you won't see us again. What we've been trying to do is give the information back through our books in particular and through reports so that people can see their own work at work, if you like. And then that also feeds into the community understanding. And this is probably our most important point, is that if you have a large community who don't understand much about wildlife, they get their attitudes from what they see other people do. And there's the quote here about, in an ambiguous situation, other people can induce conformity by providing us with information suggestive of what people generally do. No, you have to have a PhD to write like this. But so what it's really saying is, if we tell people it's okay about spiders, you're not going to get your face ripped off by having spiders in your house, so that when they see a spider, they don't feel incredibly terrified. So one aspect of these projects is to encourage an understanding and instruct people on how to manage some of the more difficult animals. And I think this is really important because of what's happening with society at the moment. And then, Adelaide's a really good example because we're this little green island surrounded by desert and it's a green island that is growing at a great rate. Our population is increasing, uh, currently was aimed to hit 1.86 million by 2036, although we're probably tracking a bit ahead of this. You know we've got in the state strategic plan a target of 2 million people um, and we're something like 23 years ahead of that. But it's not through the reproductive activities of South Australians, it's through migration. And many people are coming to South Australia from countries, from cities, from locations where there is no wildlife. Uh, they come from places like um, you know, Shanghai or, or Mumbai or Birmingham where they haven't experienced any, I think James is from Birmingham, they haven't done experience any wildlife, uh, they don't know much about it, they come out here, suddenly they're surrounded by wildlife. So we need to be engaging those, that community. And the second thing is that the state strategic plan has actually got a lot of tension built in. As we increase the population, we need to balance that with biodiversity demands and with agricultural demands. And we're seeing those tensions build up in with the marine parks legislation, with things like the, the water allocation programs in the hills. People are now starting to be told that they can't do what they've always done. So we need to be providing education about where the science has delivered what you should or shouldn't have in, um, and should and shouldn't be allowed to do with terms of wildlife and, and the natural environment. And then, of course, there's just a change in the way we live. Because we've got lots of people coming here with wholly different cultural backgrounds, um, they are accepting of new styles of development. Now, traditionally, Adelaide's a huge city, some 90 kilometres long by 40 kilometres wide, um, and it's a low-density city where we have our front yards, our backyards, are reasonably small houses in general with a, around about a 40 to 50% footprint on the block. As you can see here on my right, your left, is the traditional um, kind of suburb. That's 50 years old. That's Coromandel Parade down the middle here and Blackwood Park on the left where you can see the new st the types of suburbs. Lot smaller blocks, lot larger houses, no environment. 90% of the area is covered in hard surface. And we have done biodiversity surveys in in places like Blackwood Park there. It's a really easy survey to do because you don't find anything. There's no greenery, there's nothing living there. They're also hotter in the summer, colder in the winter, greater water runoff, very poor, sustainable type of, of living. Whereas on the right, you have a lot more life in the backyards and animals moving through the corridors. So people are moving into and becoming established in communities which are free of environment. And it's one of those Donald Rumsfeld things that people don't know what they don't know. If you grow up in an environment without wildlife, why would you necessarily expect it in your own backyard? So that's a great worry to us. Added to that is the, the feeling that is often promulgated by um, well-meaning and humorous characters that Australia is full of lethal creatures that will rip your face off rather than look at you. And if you go anywhere in the environment, you'll suffer a horrible bleeding death 
If you go into the oceans, it's the great whites that'll just want to kill you. If you in, put in any native garden, you'll get um, brown snakes here, and we all know that you die in 10 seconds or whatever it is when you're bitten by a brown snake. And you hear the same thing about spiders. And these myths are sort of promulgated, and a lot of people arrive here with a genuine fear about the Australian environment. And it's all not true. Unless, of course, you're really silly, like that boy who tried to get rid of the European wasp nest with a stick and uh, learnt the error of his ways. But all of that drives the feeling that the environment is scary and that we need to be um, alienated from it. And much of that is a basic attitude that we see developing within our community. And attitudes and behaviours are very tightly linked. Behaviour really is what people do in response to a particular environmental situation. And that behaviour can be determined by a, a large number of things. It's determined by who we are. Are we shy or timid or outgoing and inquisitive? Um, what sort of experience we've had in our, our life to date? Um, a whole lot of personal capabilities, habitat, um, habit and routine. But the most important aspect of the behaviour of the choices we made when faced with wildlife is determined by our attitudes. And this is a really important part that we need to be engaging with the communities because attitudes are the evaluations of people, objects or ideas. And they're usually polar. So they're good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant, positive and negative. And attitudes come from a lot of different sources. They can come from belief systems and faith systems in particular, as well as cultural systems in our background. They can be very visceral, very emotional, driven by feelings and also by actions of both ours and the people around us. And Phil had made a really important point about spiders where we saw that adults dropped around because they learnt bad attitudes through life and disengaged with spiders. Kids didn't have those initial poor attitudes. So attitudes actually develop over time and they come from knowledge and experience. So if you can educate and the sort of things that Rona does with um, the junior field nets, gets kids to develop good attitudes towards the environment by experience. And Rona and James had some really good projects done with junior field gnats where, where James had the kids build um, bat boxes and bird boxes and run around with nail guns and saws and all sorts of electrical apparatus. And they had a great time. It was a good experience and that they gained both knowledge and experience. So childhood experience, if it's good, is incredibly powerful. If it's bad, it can linger. And most adults who don't like spiders relate to some sort of childhood experience. And so this, we get this relationship between attitudes and behaviours. If you've got bad attitudes, you tend to have bad behaviours. If you have good attitudes, you can have good behaviours, but you might sometimes have bad behaviours as a result of not having the right knowledge and in information. And we've got three examples here. So this is a good relationship, someone with a good attitude and also delivered a good, a good behaviour and got a good outcome that was rewarding for both them and the possum. We had possums in our roof when we bought this house. They were urinating and defecating in the roof and fighting for territory and upsetting our dogs. We found out that if we could entice the possums out of the roof and into the box, we could then close off the holes in the roof and keep them outside. In fact, this worked a charm. One possum in a box outside keeps other possums from coming into his territory. Perfect possum management. Yeah, there's an issue there, but these people had a good attitude. They didn't immediately say, let's club it to death. Uh, they found out some information, really good, useful information. They obviously got it from the NRM, and then they um, applied that and got a great outcome. A bad response, someone with good attitudes but not enough in, um, knowledge to do the right thing and get into a bit of a mess is illustrated by this story here. My eldest son blocked off the entrance to the roof at midnight a couple of nights ago, but unfortunately the possum was still in the roof. At about 1.30 this morning, there was a noise from our bathroom. Upon opening the bathroom door, a possum fell through the shower vent after it had pushed it out. As the other two members of the household were too terrified to open their bedroom doors, it was left up to me to rescue the animal. This I did by utilising a couple of crab nets. Traditional possum catcher. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't think that's in our NRM fact sheets, is it? Uh, throughout the ordeal, both of us remained relatively calm or both terrified of each other. So they didn't quite know what to do, did the wrong thing, and it all kind of went pear-shaped. And then there's the straight-out bad attitudes, bad outcomes for all concerned. Uh, this is no favourite story. It's a horror story called The Possums. We lived at our house for about 25 years. In that time, I've trapped more than 100 possums. 
I'd given up counting in one 18-month period in the early mid-1980s. I trapped 30 possums. I've caught two by hand, one in the bathroom and one outside in the trunk of a tree. Now, that guy has a bad attitude in the way that he wanted to solve his possum management problems was by killing him. What he didn't know was by removing one possum, he wound up with a possum-free zone, so all the other possums came. And he was actually causing a whirlpool effect. It was ground zero for the eradication of the possums from that whole suburb, effectively. And he didn't know what he was, what he was doing, and that was a terrible outcome. And the other story, last night there were four of the exclamation marks outside, two demolishing what's left of an apricot tree, another nearby digesting the apricot leaves, and another that I only heard scrambling up a tree when I came out with a cricket bat. Now, we've all been there. We've all wanted to run screaming up and down the garden with a, with a cricket bat. It's not going to work, and all that's going to happen is that he'll wind up doing severe damage to himself and probably his tree. So those are the issues. We wanted to really come to understand that educational role and its importance in the community and then understand and develop that link between behaviours and attitudes. Some data, though, we also wanted to collect good data about wildlife. And you can get some really good information, as Phil was saying here. One of them is large scale. And so what you see here is some of the responses we got for blue tongues. And we've got on the right hand there, I can see the back surgeons, don't I? Oh, good there. OK, so on the right hand side, we've got a couple of different species. We've got, um, on my right hand side, we've got stumpies and blue tongues. And again, the circles show where they were found. So we get. Um, some range and locations. We can do it all across the, seat, the, uh, the state, as the far one demonstrates. Perhaps more important is the one in the middle, which shows where there were six species. And we can find things like spots of high species presence, like around um, Wyala there, where there were four different species of, of blue tongue, or down the southeast there were another four species. So we can get a good distribution. We can also gain information about the behaviour of the individual animals. And this actually worked quite well when we asked the question, what was the animal doing in your backyard when we saw them? And so we wind up with almost 50% noted that it was hiding, uh, another significant proportion basking, some eating, um, some mating, a bit active. Um, and so that was a fairly good picture of a day in the life of a blue tongue. 10% of the time they were dead, so again we've, we've got some people not responding to the survey appropriately, probably hadn't asked the question quite right because death isn't normally a daily activity of the blue tongue. But, but you can see you can start to put together a picture of the, of the animal. And that starts to, re to also reveal some of the, the bits of information that aren't any good that you can get from the survey, some of these limitations. And perhaps the big one is that are we getting a picture of where, in this case, blue tongues are, or is it a picture of where people who listen to the ABC radio are who have blue tongues in their backyard? And because, in fact, the, the surveys are, are basically the, the same sort of response. So therefore, all we, can, we, can't, we are limited by how we have gone about getting the community involved, and that limits the data. The other big limitation for the data is how we have asked the question. And we feel we've got a lot better at asking questions. Because if you ask a bad question, you get useless data. And this is um, an example here. We asked, where were the blue tongues um, in your garden or in your space? And almost 50% said garden. That's not really very helpful if you're looking at a microhabitat analysis of the blue tongues. And then, of course, all of the other responses were much more specific, but they're actually subsets of the garden. So we didn't get a very good picture of microhabitat selection from blue tongues, which we wanted. And then, of course, some people were incredibly specific. I mean, they would write things like veggie patch or in, in debris or on an open path, but some people wrote that they were in the fish pond. Now, yes, I know you saw the blue tongue in the fish pond, but they're not naturally aquatic. So it's not really part of its habitat or in a hot water tank or, or whatever. So they got incredibly specific. So it was a very poor question, and we didn't get good um, microhabitat information. I guess the other thing is that you've got to be very careful about getting people to identify. And this is one of the big issues for the bird survey as well. We provided a lot of information about identification, but sometimes it failed completely. We, in the possum survey, we had information about ringtails and brushtails. People pretty much got that. Then we also had pygmy possums, and people didn't get that at all. 
We had reports of pygmy possums from central Adelaide, which was, of course, mice. And we have one great story of, of someone who saw a ringtail going across a telephone line, followed by six pygmy possums. <laughs> How cute. So, unfortunately, pygmy possum data all had to be uh, deleted through misidentification. But what we really found as we were developing here is this connection between attitude and behaviour. And when we could see when people had good attitudes and good behaviours, and sometimes good attitudes and poor behaviours. And this is an example. We asked people um, what did they think brought blue tongues to their gardens. Now, a very large percent, nearly 50%, said native gardens. And that's because these were engaged people who answered the survey. And they were looking to attract wildlife to their gardens, so they put in native plants. They then saw blue tongues and said, hey, I'm doing the right thing, I'm getting native animals here. But in fact, blue tongues prefer piles of garbage, bits of iron and brick and old wood, and they really like English cottage gardens with lots of jonquils and daffodils and, um, I was going to say pancreases, what are the others, petunias, and all those sorts of happy, happy light-coloured flowers because they love to eat those, and things that attract snails and slugs. They're actually doing better in cities because they love the sort of English life that we have brought with them. So th this is a reflection of people who are transcribing their good attitudes and their actions to an outcome about blue tongues, which wasn't actually true. And in fact, it's probably water and garbage that really keep um, uh, blue tongues happy. Um, another good thing, though, about attitudes and behaviours was that many people with good attitudes towards wildlife actually gained it by feeding but they may not necessarily have been feeding the right thing or the right frequency. So we found that the major form of engagement, well, a very major form of engagement for both blue tongues and magpies was feeding, but if they fed them bread there or cheese or I think there's breakfast cereals and some really obscure things there, people were feeding them the wrong things. They were feeling good about it. They thought they were helping the birds or mints is another one, but they weren't necessarily doing the right behaviours. They may be feeding too often. A great many people fed their birds, birds every day. So they're getting a bit carried away. So again, there's an educational role, even if people have good attitudes. We also learnt from the data that people could recognise and they titrated their responses towards um, different animals. And this was really clear with the spiders. Um, we thought everybody would hate spiders all the time. And in fact, that's not true. When we looked at four different spiders, starting from daddy long legs and going through huntsmen, white tails and redbacks, various forms of lethality, there was different levels of hatred. People didn't mind daddy long legs and they tended to leave it alone. The green bars were leaving it alone. And we all do that. You've got one in the corner of your bathroom. Yeah, it's fine. Moving up to redback, kill it, kill it now. And so we've got this different response towards whether they like them. And they actually were quite good at, at identifying them. Perhaps more importantly was how they responded to the less lethal ones. And so what we found that if people had daddy long legs, they usually left it alone. Um, if they wanted to remove it, they tended to remove it themselves. If they had white tails or red backs, they tended to kill it themselves or get rid of it themselves. People actually acted on spiders they thought were a potential threat. When it came to huntsmen, these big, large, hairy spiders, people went and got dad to do it. Um, they weren't going to handle it themselves. So we got a completely different response to fight, despite the fact that it was largely a, a non-threatening spider. We also did some work, I guess, on relating um, these attitudes to the general wildlife attitudes, and we found that um, very few people really responded to the survey by considering that possums were a major issue. And this was really important for our work with councils. Remember, councils, many councils, like Burnside Council, would receive 100 complaints a month from possums, so they believed that possums were a big issue. What they didn't get was people ringing up the council to say how much they liked possums. And in fact, 85% of people didn't really think that possums were a problem. 12% spent some time on possum management, and 8% spent money on it. So there's a silent majority out there whose, whose knowledge and attitudes are not getting getting heard, and this was really important um, for councils. Um, and again, 73% of our responses, and remember, we're getting a couple of thousand responses, so it's a good swag of people um, believe that people should learn to live with possums, that um, very few percent thought they were nuisances, and very few people thought that the only good possum was a dead possum. 
And in fact, for many of our animals, for both possums and magpies and blue tongues, people actually bonded with them. And you could tell that because they gave them names. Usually it was the same letter, so it started with P, it was things like Percy Possum or Ringo the Ringtail and Rosie and Ruby. So they, they, they did R's and P's and things like that. Um, and then got down to Puddy Possum. And then the, obviously the larger possums are towards the end. Arnie, clearly Arnie Schwarzenegger. Ray Charles obviously had a vision kind of issue. Mrs. Fat Bum, Fat Possum, and the obviously enormous jab of the heart. But people are relating to them and they're bonding with them. And this was a big part of Magpie where people, we a huge array of, of magpie names and magpie stories about interaction. So what we really found out is that there's a paradox with urban wildlife that we need to recognise and manage. Most people love animals. They give us that sense of place, that, that sense of belonging to a community. And we've massively underestimated how important that is. With the Operation Magpies, we got stories about people who would record the magpie song and play it for their sons and daughters who'd gone to live in England or the US or elsewhere, and their sons and daughters get really upset and want to come home immediately because it's so evocative of where we are. And, and that sense of place and that sense of community is much more driven by wildlife than we had given to understand, even if they get a bit pissed off at times because of the, the difficulties in managing these sorts of animals. And one example, of course, is magpies. We had expected a lot more negative attitudes about magpie swooping. In fact, very few people get swooped by magpies. Mostly they didn't care. If they did, they trialled all sorts of things to protect themselves, putting plastic containers on their head, glasses on backwards and so forth. But it wasn't as big a problem as we hear. We hear about the negatives, but it's only a very small part of the problem. And this is uh, really bringing it to an end here now, the paradox of the possum. This is a great example. We were enjoying dinner at the house of friends when we heard a possum on the roof and urine started running down the living room wall. Our friends were furious and cursing and we all rushed outside, friends carrying brooms. <laughs> Sounds a little like a witch hunt or an ogre thing, doesn't it? Then we saw the possum with a baby on its back. Next minute, we were all outside with small pieces of apple trying to tempt it to eat. It was so cute. And that's the paradox that we really need to be aware of when we hear of one side of the argument presented. So what we have learned over four years is it's, it's a huge amount, really. We've got some really good biological data, and we understand the limitations about how you can use citizen science to collect biological data. Perhaps more importantly for us, we have learned that it's a really good way to understand that connection between people and wildlife, what turns them on, what turns them off, and that relative balance towards it. We also have used two different styles of data collection. We've used the, the numerics and the scales and the numbers and the percentages. And, um, I've always been traditionally a percentage person. But then we've also started collecting their stories. And historians use stories and oral histories um, as a way of understanding decision making and event formation and the creation of character. And we've heard a lot about that with things like Gallipoli. You can do the same thing with wildlife. And most of our books now, we have really focused on the stories that people have told us um, and how we can understand and identify patterns of response through story. And that's been really cool. We've learned different ways of engaging with people. Traditional media is, is great and very powerful. You have an intermediary there, whether it's Matt and Dave on the radio or the journalists writing or even TV, um, and you need to be using that medium to connect with people. Um, we have also found that your education materials are a must. Um, they're a must so that people can and do do the surveys, uh, but also you've got to get the kids involved, and the best way to get the kids involved is to get the schools involved, and Phil has been working really hard to provide materials that schools want so we can get kids engaged, and that's been very powerful. Social media is the elephant in the room. You know, it's, it's the big, the big um, change in direction, I think, for a lot of information delivery for the next 15 to 20 years. Um, it's a way, and we see a lot of politicians now using social media as a way of avoiding journalists, uh, as a way of getting their message out directly. We also see that social media is taken up by the young. If we want to get a message out to year 12s, they don't read papers, they don't even watch television because they download all their videos off the, off the web anyway, and they don't listen to the radio. So social media is going to be incredibly powerful as a direct conduit uh, to large proportions of the population. We've got to ask the right questions. I think we learnt a lot from asking the wrong questions. We didn't get any useful data, but we learnt a lot about where the limitations are. And then the bilateral exchange. In producing the books, so Phil has been you know, 
writing these books like mad thing. I take all the credit, but the reality is that Phil does most of the hard work. I just carry him along in the last little bit to produce the magpie and the possum book. And they are well taken up. And we've, when we sell them, it's great to see people sit down and start to read it and go, oh, yeah, I know that. And, yeah, been through that. And that's that connection. They're dealing with the ambiguity. People recognise that their feelings are held by others. So that bilateral exchange has been a very powerful way of engaging people. Why we engage them? We get information about wildlife. We get information about people that we can feed back to organisations like councils. Um, I've got blank here. We engage and educate people um, who already interact with wildlife so we can improve their behaviours even if they've got positive attitudes. Um, and we can understand and represent the silent majority. And we're really seeing the silent majority not get a look in in many of the environmental debates and discussions that are going on at the moment, whether it be about low carbon um, or water and how water should be shared or marine parks. There are small vocal groups and papers like to represent them equally because they like controversy and that can be a limitation of the traditional media. But the reality is there's a massive silent majority out there who, who need to have a voice. And no matter what, those who are not engaged, those who don't give a damn about wildlife, are still hearing about it. So although we are having trouble with engaging people who don't want to be engaged, they are still hearing. A little bit of connection um, is going on here. And we have to start somewhere with them. So with that, I will finish with citizen science. And, sorry, sorry. And <laughs> hand over to James, who does something completely different with citizen science. Thank you. As I said, I'm a little bit here. Sorry, I'm, I won't move again. I'm not an academic. Um, and can we have the program up, please? I thought I'd give you a little bit of a history about who I am and why I actually sit along these two very esteemed gentlemen. Um, I am a zoologist by profession. Um, studied at Townsville, went up to Townsville to do marine biology and got taken with terrestrial vertebrates more than I did uh, with marine science, although well, I spent the next five years working for CSIRO um, and the Queensland Museum. And interestingly, I worked as the Queensland Museum engaging with the public. I was one of a number of public faces where if you wanted an animal ID, you'd give me a call. And uh, I primarily looked after marine and mammals at the time. And it led me into birds uh, because all these people kept ringing up about birds. They're all interested in birds. Um, and I started looking at birds and just got fascinated. In fact, that overtook the other studies I was doing. Um, and as a consequence, I, I went and did an honours project, sorry, I'll go back, on this particular bird here called a Brahmini kite. Um, across much of its range, it is a scavenger. And a um, uh, quite eminent biologist wrote, surely it is the most regal of scavengers because it is a beautiful bird. And it was a wonderful combination of um, dealing with my new passion and what I'd done historically. Now, when I finished that particular project, I went overseas and I was only going over there for three months, did the obligatory working in a pub, ended up working overseas for about um, 13 years. And I couldn't get a job for love nor money in zoology. And I thought, well, there's the end of that career. I'll start a different one. And I end up working in sales and marketing. Um, and for a brilliant company that was dealing with the animal health industry. So I got to learn about communication, learn about education from an entirely different perspective that really brought things back to zoology. But while I was in the UK, I never lost my passion for wildlife. And I joined organisations like the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. 1.1 million members. Extraordinary. The Blair government um, before, uh, not the last election, the election before that, the RSPB was actually approached by the Labor Party and said, how do you engage the public the way you do? So we've got a lot to learn here. Um, British Trust for Ornithology and... Um, the Wildlife Trusts. And one of the things these organisations do very differently to what I had experienced growing up in the 80s and 90s in Queensland, and yes, a lot more redneck than, than South Australia, but you really had to earn your stripes if you want to see rare or unusual wildlife. What right do you have to go out and see that particular animal? When I went over to Britain, um, a colleague I worked with was a real twitcher, and I wasn't 
in that league, but he knew I was fascinated with birds and wildlife generally. And I'd get a phone call from someone five hours away saying, there is a lesser sandpiper five kilometres down the road. I go, okay. <laughs> that bird hasn't been in Britain for 16 years. So she, oh, all right, I'll go and have a look. This is obviously important. And I'd go down the road and you'd turn up and there are a hundred bird watchers here. And you're there. Oh, and someone would see you didn't really know what you were doing. And you go, you're here to see the sandpiper, aren't you? Yeah, that'd be it. Okay, go down there. That crowd will sort you out. So you wander down and, ah, come, it's over here, it's over here. Set up here, great spot. And they'd point out, right, it's the small one in that bunch of 12. It's got an eyebrow. It's really delicate, much like. So I walk away an hour later being engaged by the community, being aware of this bird and having a really positive experience. By comparison to back in Queensland, I didn't earn my stripes, so I didn't get to see that bird. I come here to South Australia, and I must admit, Adelaide's about halfway between Queensland and Britain. We've got a lot to learn as far as public engagement. But my first exposure to citizen science was in Britain. Back in the late 90s, I joined the British Trust for Ornithology, and at the time, they were doing um, weekly surveys with members of the public, just like yourselves, that were reported on a quarterly basis of the birds that were in people's backyards. And by birds, it was the species and the maximum number of seen at any one time. Um, the BTO had already asked you what your garden habitat was like, whether you had a pond, uh, whether you had a big or a small garden, all that sort of thing. So they had the background data on that. And they had been collecting, at this stage when I joined, that information for 17 years. Now it's been for over 25. And they get 11,500 people return this survey on a quarterly basis. Now, imagine, both from a longitudinal and a mining perspective, as science is concerned, how much information. They have it down to, um, this species no is number one uh, in this particular quarter and has been for the last three years, but before that it was number three. So its uh, prevalence has been increasing, et cetera, et cetera. Just amazing data. Um, and you go on to probably the largest survey I'm aware of its kind, Citizen Science Survey, that's run twice a year in the UK, the Big Garden Bird Watch. They invite anyone to go out and watch for one hour over one weekend, twice a year, birds in whatever environment they want to. It can be their backyard, it can be a local school, it can be a park, it can be a national park. And this year, in January, they had 610,000 people participate in this. They reported over 10 million birds in that one weekend. What sort of data is available from that? And how much are you engaging the public? You're engaging people that are experts, but very often you're engaging people that aren't experts. And you're taking them on a journey, because one of the aspects about all three of those organisations I mention, here we talk about wildlife often, present company excluded, about the Coorong or the Flinders or the Great Barrier Reef or Eyre Peninsula. They're places out there that people aren't every day. One of the really clever things they do in Britain is they start with the familiar. They start in your backyard. And once you know the dozen, two dozen birds in your backyard, why don't you go down to the local park and you get another two or three? go to the closest national park, which might only be small, and then go to revered national parks five hours away. So they engage in an entirely different way and they bring the community with them. I think that's something we've really failed to do here in Australia very well, other than, as I said, these two gentlemen, some people in WA and some people in Queensland. Also, engaging with the public about wildlife. We had Wild Watch here about seven or eight years ago and a survey, three episodes ran on the ABC. They had 25,000 people respond um, to a survey from that particular Wild Watch program. In Britain, they have been running for over 10 years Spring Watch, where for somewhere between four and six weeks, they will send a team of scientists and journalists out to find out what is happening from courtship to breeding to nesting behaviours to rearing young or what's happening in dens. And this goes for 10 minutes before the news every night. So as a consequence, you have people watching 
the trials and tribulations of wildlife, they're not just something out there, they're something they're engaging with on a daily basis and what's happening to Mrs Fatbottom today sort of thing. And they know these individuals by name. And this is on a national basis with millions of people watching. Um, I returned to Australia and I, working for this pharmaceutical company, had the opportunity to come back and work in pharmaceuticals. And, cause, and I came back to Adelaide because my wife is an Adelaidean and I'd only been here once before. And I had the opportunity, as you get maybe once in your life, to say, I can do anything I wanted to do. And I said, right, I want to, the way they do in Britain, try and engage people with wildlife and open their eyes to the wonders that's around them every day. So I set up a business that makes nest boxes and sends them around the country, um, co collaborates on research with the university. I import things from overseas and have a great time. Love doing what I'm doing. Um, and when I got back to Australia, one thing I knew is I needed to get involved with the people that were in touch with the community and knew about the subject matter. And Adelaide Connections, you say, oh, be very careful what you do in Adelaide, someone's going to know you. And I managed to hear <laughs> about Chris Daniels and I thought, oh, okay, I need to do a little research and find out a little bit more about Chris Daniels. <laughs> and when you put into the internet Chris Daniels, this is one of the first <laughs> images that it's appears. Like, it's thought, like looking in a mirror, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> This isn't the person I met, but then Chris popped up and I had heard him on the radio and I said, I need to meet this person. I went along and met Chris and um, ended up becoming one of his students in one of his master's projects. And the project I took on was possums. And I was reviewing the state strategic plan that had been published the year before. And there were seven objectives to this particular strategic plan. And uh, DEH as it was then, then and now, did two of those objectives brilliantly. Um, in the surveys we did, they scored over 90%. But in the key one, which was engaging the public, they performed incredibly poorly. And the reason being, they had defined their market as the public, but their public was the public Chris had just referred to as the vociferous minority that had problem with possums. And in DEH's opinion at that point in time, possums were a problem that we needed to manage. They didn't understand that it was actually managing the people that was the priority. What could we do about the animals? Um, at the same time, a student was doing Operation Blue Tongue and Chris, I and Philip by that stage chatted, this is the next obvious thing to do. And as Chris pointed out, 85% of the population are really actually very happy and want to live with possums. It's the vociferous minority we hear often that we need to overcome because there are so many good stories out there that need to be shared. Um, from there, I was involved in Operation Blue Tongue, Operation Magpie, Operation Spider, including the Meacher spiders that we held at um, the South Australian Museum, where getting curatorial staff to meet the public and getting that interface going so people could talk about this amazing subject. We had one particular individual that came along on Bring Us Your Bugs that brought in about 35 different species of arachnid. He was just fascinated with spiders. So, and some of these spiders were really rare or unusual. And it was a sort of engagement that haven't, hasn't happened before. The curatorial staff loved it. The museum staff loved it. It worked really well for the ABC. And it was pioneered by Chris and Philip in particular because another project we have going is writing a book to help people engage with wildlife about the wildlife of Greater Adelaide. And when we came to look at the invertebrates, hence the name Bring Us Your Bugs, we actually, there are a lot of gaps in the photographs we had and the knowledge we had. So we thought, why not try and engage the public and get them and come and tell us what they're finding and what is important, which helped us steer where we were going with the book. Um, I do other volunteer work and one of the groups I'm associated with is the Natural Resource Centre up at Norton Summit and we run a lot of children's programs um, over a number of years but associated with Operation Spider we actually had people drawing spiders, understanding the difference between insects, between spiders, even between slugs. What's an invertebrate? 
what does a backbone mean? That sort of thing. And one of the great projects they did on this slide was they actually built a human-sized spider's web. And students got to see and construct how this happened and what could happen. Um, both Philip and Chris have mentioned brush-tailed possums used to be found over 85% of our state, now found over about 25% of our state. There has been, anyone gets the Eastern Courier, there has been argy-bargy about possums for the last three months, again in the Eastern Courier, until the editor said, I've had enough of this. And people saying, I can take you to a spot where you can see 100 possums in a night. Great, take me there. It just doesn't exist. We need to get better understanding to a wider um, source of the community. One of the other things that came out about operation, all of the operations, is people love to share. So after speaking with uh, Chris and Philip, um, I actually created a social networking website called Backyard Wildlifers, where people can just come on and share their experience, be it photographs, be it video, be it a story, be it a question, about the wildlife that happens in their own backyard. And I guess the take home message from what Philip and Chris have said, but my experience engaging at much more ground level in backyards on a daily basis is it really doesn't matter where you are and what you're doing, be it you're a high powered Chris Daniels or be it you have a balcony and a few friends you can influence, you can make a difference. Mm. And that's what we need to do. We each need to make a difference. So thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That was a wonderful series of talks. Look, are there any questions out there from the audience? Rob. Thanks for that. Sort of question and comment, really. You, you stress, I'm really pleased to see you stressing the reports that you produce out of this work and you feed it back to the people. And that's really important, but it has its dilemmas. I was for five years the chair of Water Watch South Australia and had the unhappy task of closing the committee down when the national funding stopped. Had it not been for the NRM here, I think Water Watch would have had a very dismal future. But what was lost in the national funding and the national coordination were those things that people had really got involved with, like taking a snapshot of the waterways mm -hmm. at a particular time every year, which just gave you this annual kind of picture of Australian waterways. And there were people who were doing this who would happily go out and stand waist deep in an ice cold stream to take <laughs> meticulous readings mm. because they thought it would be used and it would make a difference. And plainly they discovered it was not being used and it would never make a difference and I wonder if they ever got engaged again. Uh, mm. On the other hand, you'd get people who are teachers who are saying, do not use these results. I'm using it for training my students and you can't trust them because mm. they're making lots of mistakes. But it's useful anyway to get them involved. So you have this enormous collection of stuff, some of which of you yourself have found you can't trust. Uh, when I ran the nest box project, lots of people were saying, oh, blackbirds are using my boxes. Of course, they're starlings. So there's the dilemma there. That the reports are really crucial to find a way not just of feeding the information back, but showing people that it's making a difference of being used is crucial. Mm. But how do you depend upon the information you're getting which is well-meaning, but often extremely, I mean, you know, cat equals, yeah. equals possum. Uh, what's Let the best way of dealing with that? And also, what's the best way of getting all these reports together? I tried to get the Water Watch stuff in a sort of, um, uh, not amateur section, but sort of citizen section of the State of the Environment report. Mm -hmm. And all the scientists said, oh, you can't trust that, it's all amateurs. But we need something which is the kind of citizen's equivalent Hmm. where we put all these things together and say, this is what you're doing. Uh, great comments and great questions, Rob. Uh, I think there are two questions, and I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer the second one first, I think, and that is about um, how do you report back. And uh, we've done that in two, well, actually three ways, three important ways. Firstly, um, through the radio, through uh, the radio station and going on, on, on the air and talking about the results, because that gets an enormous amount of people, I think, uh, uh, the time slots that we talk get something like, uh, is it 20,000 people listening? Mm. Uh, yeah. Great, great audience um, to, to talk to, so to, to give results directly back in a, in a really easily digestible way. Uh, secondly, we've put reports online, so they're free. So people can download them online. And we've also made some, uh, some paper copies of those and posted them to people if, they've wanted a, if they don't have access to the internet. Uh, and so they can download that information for free and find out the results of their work that they've contributed to, they have some ownership of that, 
and it's the voice of the community as we've talked. Uh, and the third way is, of course, we've done the books. Uh, the books, though, cost money, so they're not perhaps as accessible to some people as others, but it means we can put a lot more effort and time into uh, really analysing these results and putting together these, these, these books that are, again, the voice of the community, and we've had a great response. Uh, people are really, uh, people are buying them firstly, and we're getting great feedback uh, from people who read them. So um, a sort of a, a, a three-part strategy um, to firstly get to reach lots of people, to give some more, some more detailed information that is that free and easily digestible, and then um, to, to put together some more detailed responses um, and get that back to the community. That's uh, the, that's the, that's the, uh, the second question. I just, yeah. I just wanted to, ca oh, oh, probably part of the second question. Well, no, but the quality, that's, quali that's what mm. I was going to answer. In fact, we, we tend to get a bit pompous as scientists about quality control as if all of the experiments we do are immediately publishable. And in fact, that's not true. There's quite a few scientists in here who've got filing cabinets full of data as that, that were when we were trialling stuff and finding out stuff and we've stuffed up. It's okay for some of it not to be useful. And in fact, a training exercise, as it's a training for us, is often as useful um, as any of the, the, the really good data because it tells you what not to do further on. And I think one of our roles has been convincing, and I know there's other scientists here, of, of convincing people that you can progress and you can bring people along. If it doesn't work, as long as you've learned something from the process, you've already got something out of it. And then you pluck the eyes out of it. And one thing that Phil has particularly been driving is the best, the best data has come through people's stories because they're never poorly structured. They're, you know, they're never crap. They're, they're because they are, by definition, people's stories. So when we get them and then we filter them through them and using a whole other Heidegger philosophies and phenomenology and all of the stuff that oral historians use, that's always gold and you can get tremendous understanding about the social. So that's, that's been a really powerful component here. So I'm pretty comfortable with the fact that, that yes, there are data that isn't useful um, and that some people may not want to use. Uh, because there's always gems there. And look, if it's a really good scientific project, as the other scientists here would know, you may not know what the gems are until after you've done it. Mm. I've got another point to make, and it's, you have to look at a citizen science project as you're constructing it and work out how you can improve the validity of the data that you're going to collect. And the first thing you can do is run a great education program. So to give people the information so that they can collect good data for you. And there's been great uh, research done in the US on um, collecting w volunteers collecting water samples and then comparing that to scientists collecting water samples. And the volunteers have a small amount of training uh, and, it's, and it's shown that the, uh, the consistency of the volunteers is higher than the scientists in some cases. So the first thing is the education certainly program. Certainly higher than some of their students. <laughs> the, s the second one is um, uh, checking the data. So and this is talking broadly, not specifically about our projects, but but uh, uh, validating the data, if you like, so that if you have someone collecting information about plants, they can, and what type of plants they're seeing in a location, they can send in a sample that's validated. The third thing you can do is you can run a, an actual training program. So we've put education resources with our projects online that people can download that give people enough information to be able to distinguish between a brush tail possum and a ring tail possum, which we've been studying. Some things are a little trickier to do. Uh, for instance, identifying a pygmy possum. And we found that for Operation Possum, the, the data that we collected uh, about pygmy possums was spurious, to say the least. Um, but you can run a training program. We could have had people come in and do a, a workshop for a day on identifying pygmy possums, and then we could have used that data. So there's, a, there's that sort of extra level you can take it to, if you need to, depending on what you're studying. So it's about the design of the project. You need to look at what you're trying to achieve and work out whether people are capable of doing that for you, and if they're not already capable, then what do they need to what do they need to make them capable? And that's how you make sure you're collecting valid data. Yeah, and indeed on that front, I mean, you mentioned nest boxes earlier. Um, Rona had a has a program going with the junior field nats, and I know the NRM are looking for something. So we're trying to create recording sheets that reduce things to the lowest common denominator, so people can, like they were in the UK, we're not after. Um, we're after the species they see and a maximum count. So it doesn't matter if you see three today, five tomorrow, 12 on Saturday and one on Sunday, the maximum count is 12. 
So that is a consistent measure they can do. So we're trying to look at some of the work we're doing. We're engaging different parts of the community to have it simplified. So yeah, perhaps we're not getting the breadth of information we would, but we're getting a depth that we couldn't hope to mm. acquire otherwise. But the type of data is really important. And the slide that, uh, that Chris showed of the blue tongue distributions uh, across South Australia, now the size of the dots show the number of blue tongues that were sighted. And, and that's probably not useful information, but it's the location of the dots that is useful because it's showing the range of the species. So we can say that, that that type of blue tongue, that species of blue tongue was spotted here, here and here, and, th and that's its range. But the size of the dots, because you have an inconsistent number of people collecting data, isn't necessarily relevant. So you have to look at what data you're trying to collect. Mm. We also found that you can have different sorts of citizen scientists, even within individual projects. Mm. So with Operation Magpie, for example, we wanted to collect information about what Maggies were doing in your garden, really straightforward. Then we added, and you can be a magpie observer. So this is, if you were being an animal behavioralist, this is how you do a time budget for what these animals were doing. And you're supposed to record with a stopwatch, whether they're you know, feeding or fighting or bonking or whatever they were doing, over a 20 minute period. And then that would be useful, but that's what an animal behavioralist does. Now only um, a handful, a couple of hundred people did that and bothered to do all the reading that we would include then about how you can take animal behavior type data and make it really useful. So we had a different subset there, and I think that's something. But it just I really mm. want to reiterate Phil's point about quality assurance. Our job here is that, that continual education. And as things popped up through the six weeks, we would go on and bring up, hey, this has become an issue with some people. They don't know how to handle that, or this is how you collect this sort of data or whatever. And then make sure that you understand where the limits are as you're going along. Because all citizen science is going to have a fault in it somewhere. But then, as I said, uh, not every honour student has got a publishable thesis. Uh, not every piece of work that I've done is ever publishable. So we mustn't get too critical of people trying their hardest. But if you don't give it back, then you do lose them. If you set this up as you're participating in science and then they don't see anything again, it's actually worse than, than this if you've done nothing at all. And that's the big issue. But you know, your books, Rob, that you've produced, and Tracks and Traces and those sorts of guides and um, really practical information about wildlife turns out to be the absolute best. If people give it and then you give back practical information, they really love it. Any more questions? That was a long question. That was a very long <laughs> question. Long answers. You've all got all the information you need. That's amazing. Oh, here we go. So assuming that uh, all these have been successful research projects, where do you go from here? Oh, that's an outstanding mm. question. Mm. Um, <laughs> we... we often late at night, about seven o'clock, and cork the bottle of red and sit around and argue about where we're gonna go next. But I think the social media thing has opened up a whole new avenue, um, and the fact that probably a lot of our interest has now gone down towards that relationship between people and wildlife. We're kicking around, because Phil's got not much else to do except write up his PhD, so what we would like to do is actually expand and go worldwide. He doesn't, he doesn't laugh anymore when I say that. <laughs> he used to laugh, but he doesn't now. Now he sobs quietly a lot. Um, we thought we'd, it'd be great to go worldwide and look at an, an animal that is um, found in many different locations and amongst communities with very different attitudes towards, towards them. So we wanted to do an Operation Sparrow and actually run that through education and through Facebook and see if we can get communities around the world to tell us what a sparrow's doing in China, what are they doing in England, what are they doing in the US, what are they doing in Africa, so you get some behaviour, and then what do you think about them there? And that's a good way of getting schools to link with classes around the world, and we can do that through social media fairly well. It's going to take a, a lot of work, um, it's been quite a challenge, but to get different communities, and to get to understand that people in, in poor parts of Africa, where there are lots of sparrows, or poor parts of China have a very different view of wildlife than we do. Um, you know, if, if you, many, many parts of China, food is simply a staple and anything that comes into your personal space, you can catch and eat. You know, we don't hold that philosophy, although we've only moved from it relatively recently when we've given up duck hunting and quail hunting and um, so forth. So you've got that change and I think that could be incredibly powerful. Plus there's some really interesting data about differences in behaviour between animals in the same species in different locations. 
And there is a really cool citizen science project in Europe at the moment where they're calling for photographs of garden snails. And then the, the scientists are analyzing the pictures, the patterns of the swirls, and then tracing evolutionary lineages of, through the snails as they are, uh, move across, as they, as they are all across as Europe. they move slowly across Europe. They're very slow. <laughs> they're not moving, but the patterns of evolution are moving across. And I think we might see some of that with behavior for things like sparrows around the world. Uh, so that's his job. I have a question. Um, given that up in the hills, as I'm sure you're all aware, we have a problem with rats and mice and various things, particularly this time of year. Would you do a project that dealt with those sorts of exotics which threaten the young or otherwise yeah. of uh, some of our native animals? I mean, that's a great question, but doing something that people hate, they tend to turn off. So when we decided on sparrows, a lot of people like sparrows or at least consider them as harmless, whereas in fact they're still an introduced bird. They have been in plague proportions. There used to be sparrow clubs that were paid government levy to go out and shoot the things and bring their little heads in and you got tuppence a, a head. It must be a bit ghoulish, really, coming with a bag of sparrow heads. But, you know, there was a time when, you know, they were a significant pest and they were an introduced. But you've got to like them and you've got to engage with them and then you deliver that information. If you try to do rats, it's a bit like doing cockroaches. You just probably wouldn't get the buy-in. Mm, the people spider still, effect. Yeah, yeah, people are still catching them, though. They're catching rats? Yes. Oh, so look. So, yeah. so the information's there, I guess. It is, but would they actually do a survey and participate? It's part of the charismatic thing that Phil was talking about. It, it's often better to be charismatic but not have the same issues. Mm. So animal choice is really important. Um, just responding to that same question about people reporting non-native or pest species, I actually manage a program where we do do that. We actually encourage people who are around the marine environment to report marine pests. And the good thing about this is that um, partly we help government to manage those pests before they get out of control, but we're also educating and engaging people, but they understand that it's actually to their benefit to report those oh. pests because if they take over an environment, it means they might not have any fish left or they might not be able to do what they normally do if those pests get out of control. So there is a certain... Um, yeah, it's actually quite exciting to engage a whole set of people that we've never engaged before, coming from a greeny movement. We're engaging people at recreational fishers and the boating community to tell them to clean their boats, oh. look out for unusual things, and then those reports come to us, and then we report things that we know are unusual directly to PERSA, who take care of biosecurity. So, yes, it can be done. We do it on a very uh, ongoing, opportunistic basis. It's not just do it this month. We just to encourage people to do it all the time because you have to have that vigilance if you're, especially in the marine environment, uh, prevention is much cheaper than eradication. So mm. there you go. It's a great program that you run and I, I think one key point you've got is that you, you're engaging recreational fishers, people who are engaged in that, in that um, area. Yeah, they uh, have a vested interest. Vested interest. Oh. Um, a bit harder to do with rats. What's people with vested interest in the rats in, the, in their garden? And I, there's I'm a stigma sure associated with it. And I often get, oh, I've got possums in the roof, and you discuss it, and actually you've got rats. Mm. And I couldn't have rats. No. <laughs> and, well, actually, t about once every other year <laughs> I have rats. That's right, we call them fruit rats in the eastern <laughs> suburbs. Or tree rats. Or rats or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and the other, the other The other point you've got is that I think the, marine, the understanding of the marine environment is quite a long way behind in the general community, the understanding of the terrestrial environment. And we don't actually get that there's all of these plague introduced species there, and you know, the Pacific sea star and the green crab and the zebra mussel. And in fact, we've still dumped you know, um, salmon trout and Atlantic salmon and all these things have been released there that have incredible effect on the environment. So you're, you've got that process of educating that, that it's not just um, a land-based thing, this new introductions of species, that it it's occurs in the, the aquatic, the marine, the, the, the littoral zone as well. And that's a really important. We've, we've got a long way to go to catch up with our education mm. for marine environment. A tricky one, though. So something we certainly yeah. need to work on, and this is the sort of things we want to learn more about with the engagement strategies, we, strategies we're using. How do you engage people um, that aren't engaged or uh, are uh, anti-engaged? And we have looked at, at either marine or, or freshwater fishing and to do a fish. But we've actually backed off it because we've also got to be careful of political agendas. And it's so easy to hijack a citizen science project with a political agenda. I mean, we very nearly did marine fish, but I think if we did that now, 
it probably would never take off because we would wind up fighting a marine parks issue and not doing a citizen science project. So we have to be careful about that, uh, that as well. Any other questions? Is that, is that all? Okay.